Thank you for, uh, for choosing to learn about ARDS um, uh, today. And uh, there are a couple of faces in the audience who've been at a previous talk that I gave, and some of the first slides will be a little bit duplicate of that, because I think the same principles are very important in this talk. Uh, so I appreciate your patience. I was asked to speak about uh, ARDS identifying by genotype. Um, I have uh, no relevant disclosures like Michael. I uh, am part of a grant that came from GlaxoSmithKline to study uh, uh, biomarkers in ARDS and critical illness that is not relevant to this uh, discussion. Uh, so this is the way that I'm going to approach this question of can we identify by genotype. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is talk about some of these definitions about genotype, phenotype, endotype. And then I want to focus directly on some of the genetic studies that our group and others have done of ARDS to say, can we actually operationalize this? So uh, what's a genotype? What's a phenotype? Um, a phenotype is defined as the composite of an organism's observable characteristics or traits. This became apparent in the turn of the last century uh, in, uh, when this genotype-phenotype distinction became very important. And if you think about it, a butterfly has the same genotype, a butterfly has the same genotype as a caterpillar, yet it has a very different phenotype. One flies, one crawls, and eats leaves. So when you think about ARDS, while we may have the same genotype when our lungs are healthy as when we get ARDS, with an evoked phenotype, uh, uh, with, excuse me, with an extreme uh, critical illness, this may pre present an evoked phenotype uh, that leads to ARDS, and hopefully we can regress back to a normal lung. Uh, I will use the word endotype, and uh, another word for this is subphenotype. Uh, this is a more recent term uh, that uh, refers to a subtype of a condition defined by a distinct functional or pathobiological mechanism. Uh, I believe that this concept is inherent in the process of syndrome evolution. For example, when you think of the way myocardial infarction has evolved uh, over time, uh, when I learned about it in medical school, it was um, uh, uh, symptoms and EKG changes, and then different biological markers have been added over time, and then those biological markers have taken on a life of their own, creating things like a non-ST segment elevation MI. Uh, genetic endotype work is underway, as Michael had said, in lung cancer, uh, looking at the EGFR receptor. Uh, Crohn's disease, the IL-23 receptor as well. Uh, so Gordon just left the room, I think, to go to the, uh, uh, the Ebola talk, but the, um, uh, if you think about the ARDS definition, this, uh, you have the original 1994 consensus definition. Some of the people in the room were part of this, Michael. I think uh, uh, some of your colleagues have described it as a bunch of people got in a room in Barcelona and drank a lot of wine and agreed on this particular definition, uh, um, with the absence of congestive heart failure, it was somewhat improved in 2011. Similar criteria, different semantics. But one of the things that the Berlin Group did that I thought was uh, very uh, uh, useful was in addition to showing that the mild, moderate, severe classifications uh, had higher mortality and ventilator-free days, they also brought a little bit of biology into it in showing that they had higher lung weight higher shunt fractions, indicating that the, phys the pathophysiology was worse. This is physiology, not necessarily the underlying biology. And so when you think about composite syndromes like ARDS, I view it as very similar uh, to rheumatologic diagnoses like lupus. Uh, those characteristics, uh, the, the characteristics that we use to define ARDS are clinical and, and similar. So uh, I, I think that this is a very important point about how you can think about genetic subphenotypes of these uh, um, uh, of these syndromes, and this is work done by Lindsay Criswell at UCSF, who's a rheumatologist, and there had been a series of genome-wide association studies implicating the STAT4 gene, and in fact, there are therapies that are under development right now uh, along this axis, and what she said was, well, within lupus, we have different flavors, and looked at these different flavors and their association in a composite meta-analysis and found that, you know, it was really driven by nephritis and by vascular uh, uh, injury, and that when you looked at those who had mucocutaneous lupus, you had the opposite effect. And what this implies to me is that if we roll out a STAT4 therapy and apply it to everybody that in lupus, that you may actually be doing harm to some. Uh, also, that you might um, be uh, uh, diluting an effect uh, by including all of these people in your, in your clinical trials. So this, to me, is a call for thinking about genotype stratified uh, therapeutic trials. So can one redefine ARDS by genotype? And the question is, can we identify genetic endotypes of, of ARDS? So the first question you have to ask is, is ARDS genetic? Uh, 
Um, I think that the hypothesis that evolutionary pressures select on mechanisms that are important to risks and outcomes of ICU syndromes is pretty well supported by an understanding of evolutionary biology. Um, I've said this before, but I view my ICU um, essentially as a microcosm, an intense microcosm of all things that affected uh, uh, natural selection and evolution. Uh, we basically, as a species, evolved, um, although in the states, I feel, some states we still have to say intelligently designed, I'm not sure in, in the US, but we evolved to, uh, to survive bleeding, plagues, dehydration, starvation, temperature extremes. I mean, this is the, the ICU at Penn. Uh, so how do you study this, right? How do you study this? Um, the classic way to do genetic studies that are very powerful are family-based studies. Uh, the problem with ARDS is you have this extreme exposure to just be at risk and, you know, absent bus accidents at family mm -hmm. reunions or things like that. You don't have family aggregates that, had, that have had a similar insult. Um, so it's very difficult to do this. So we're left with sort of uh, cohort studies and uh, other types of studies. Uh, uh, with one slight exception, we've been working with colleagues in, in Iceland. It does look like there might be a heritability, but these are very small numbers. So, uh, so stay tuned on that one. Uh, so we did a cohort study uh, in uh, our first sort of broader uh, genome-wide association uh, uh, and focused, as Michael uh, uh, very nicely pointed out, on one of the subgroups of at risk for ARDS. And we chose major trauma largely because it's a stochastic event. Uh, people are walking down the street, safe drops on their head, they get shot, beaten up with a bat, fall off a ladder. And in general, we're in a, we're in a uh, somewhat normal state of health prior to their traumatic injury. Um, we had five centers that got together on this. Uh, like most trauma studies, uh, the majority of them were male. Mean age was relatively young. Uh, this is a small genome-wide association study, uh, so much of what I'll show you uh, has to be interpreted in that, in that light that many of the negative results uh, are not truly negative. Um, we had a discovery population versus population controls, and then we had at-risk trauma controls, and finally had a phase three functional evaluation uh, looking at expression of, um, uh, of gene products in, uh, in uh, transformed B lymphocytes. Uh, we carried forward our top 1% of loci, and this led 147 variants that were adjusted for clinical characteristics and carried forward to functional validation. Here's the requisite Manhattan plot. For those of you not used to looking at one of these, this, these are each of your chromosomes. This is the negative log of the p-value. And in general, somewhere around here is a cutoff for significance. So we did have some that looked, uh, that looked pretty interesting. Um, but the one that dragged through and replicated was this gene uh, uh, that led to uh, uh, an expressed mRNA that was uh, a gene called PPFIA1. And so what is this, uh, this, uh, this gene and this gene product? Um, so never underestimate the creativity of an investigator to explain the results after the fact. Um, yet, I think this is kind of cool, right? And so, <laughs> so, uh, so this is um, a uh, uh, this is uh, something called Liprin Alpha, and I had to look this up. And there's not a lot of literature on it, but it basically regulates the disassembly of focal adhesion cell matrix interactions, and really has a, a, a tight, a, a, an important role. Uh, of interacting with uh, activated integrins. And so Dean Shepard and others at UCSF have been uh, studying this in lung injury uh, for quite some time. And we're just starting to understand and get the reagents up to, to be able to study this protein. But I think it's kind of neat. Uh, as I said, this was a small study. So, um, so we have to be uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that the things that were left on the cutting room floor might be really important. And so these are, uh, um, these are some genes that were uh, uh, many of them with actually functional variants that, uh, that did not necessarily show function in the cell type that we looked at. In particular, Jack Elias's favorite gene, chitinase 1, replicated in our, in our populations. Uh, and there are some others, such as tetraspanin, that, that, uh, that are uh, being actively researched in ARDS. Another way to use these sort of broad uh, genetic uh, studies to, to understand um, uh, ARDS is, uh, is this idea of, uh, of using sort of convergent uh, um, uh, or meta-analyzed studies to, uh, to identify important evolutionary uh, uh, types. And so um, supporting this hypothesis, even going down to 2009, is that, you know, um, <laughs> genome-wide studies that were done in autoimmune diseases, metabolic diseases, have actually a lot of times yielded the same gene. And so this IL-23 receptor thing, I think, really has legs where it defines Crohn's disease, psoriasis, and now asthma. And so really um, providing support for the idea that we can redefine complex syndromes according to a, uh, um, 
uh, it, a common underlying genetic uh, variation. And so one of the ones that, uh, that jumped out at this, and this is the work done by John Riley in our group, uh, uh, was this uh, what we found in the ABO gene. And really what happened was a guy named Murdoch Riley, who's at Penn and works with us, had done a big genome wide of myocardial infarction. And it came up blood group. And then he started looking at a whole bunch of other things, and it came up blood group. And then we looked up, and uh, uh, Josh Akey and others at University of Washington who study these evolutionary bottlenecks showed, bless you, Gordon, showed that, um, that, these, uh, that these evolutionary bottlenecks um, uh, uh, really jump out with this blood group, and most people had just ignored it and said, oh, it's your blood group, it's your blood group. Um, but it's associated with uh, myocardial infarction, venous thromboembolism, and then when you do these sort of hypothesis-free, what determines your von Willebrand factor level, what determines your ICAM level, and E and P selectins, as Michael showed you, the top thing is your ABO. And so the, the neat thing about ABO, without going too much into it, is it's actually not just these things on your red blood cells. It, it, it encodes these ubiquitous glycotransferases that affect platelets, affect your, your, your endothelium, affect proteins in the way that they're cleared. Um, I presented some of this earlier in, in, in a talk I gave, so I, I didn't want to get too much into the detail of it, but we looked at blood group A, and then we looked at some of the blood group A genetic subtypes, and uh, in... Uh, in uh, consistent with, excuse me, consistent with prior studies, uh, A, where blood group A is the higher risk of myocardial infarction, higher risk of venous thromboembolism, we found that blood group A uh, uh, conferred a higher risk of ARDS in both trauma and sepsis populations, very similar odds ratios, not affected by adjustment for clinical variables. So a belief that, uh, that, that this might actually represent a very different uh, pathophysiology within the development of ARDS um, that may be more along the vascular side. Uh, uh, and that, um, that this may represent something that we carry with us that affects our, our, our risk of MI, that affects our risk of venous thromboembolism. Uh, we have data now showing that it affects our risk of acute kidney injury that I presented yesterday. And so I, I've really sort of bought into this, that, that your blood group may actually be a really important endotype in how we respond to critical illness. Okay, those were the sort of genome-wide studies. Now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about uh, two uh, different proteins that came out of larger scale candidate gene approaches. And Michael uh, did an absolutely beautiful job of setting up the biology of angiopoietin II. So uh, fortunately, I don't have to go into that too much. Um, the idea of doing candidate gene studies uh, has, uh, was really where a lot of the genetics of ARDS started. Um, this is this sort of looking under the lamp where people had something they were studying in their lab or something that fascinated them and they'd look at a couple of genetic variants within the gene. And some of these have replicated over time, uh, including some of the uh, proteins that I'm gonna talk about or gene products I'm gonna talk about, angiopoietin II and IL-1RN. So most of this work has been championed by Nula Meyer uh, at, at our institution, so I'm, I'm fortunate to, to present her work. Uh, the way we approached this was to do multi-stage cohort studies. We used a large-scale candidate gene chip that was created for the NHLBI CARE Consortium. So basically, a bunch of people got together and said, what are all the things that could affect vascular uh, lung uh, uh, phenotypes, and created a 2,000 gene list, and then did all the hard genetic uh, work to, to make sure that they were represented on this chip. The derivation population, again, we chose this trauma population because of the, uh, the stochastic nature of the insult. Uh, and uh, we used uh, what we would call race-specific discovery. We actually did this using uh, ancestry informative markers on the chip. But we started in the African-American population due to the uh, uh, more heterogeneity, uh, smaller block sizes, and uh, in general, more variation. And, and it's, a, it's a good discovery population. Uh, we then validated in separate external populations. And so starting with the, the African-American population, uh, three genes actually replicated and, uh, excuse me, uh, met our uh, predefined uh, cutoff of, of uh, uh, 1 times 10 to the minus fourth for chip-wide significance. And two of them uh, were SNPs that were tightly linked in the angiopoietin gene. Um, a little bit of winner's curse here where the derivation and replication odds ratios are less, but significant p-values even when adjusting for multiple comparisons. And the neat thing is that the one of these that really replicated heavily uh, appears to code a splice variant, meaning that it leads to different types of the protein or isoforms of angiopoietin II. Um, we asked this question essentially by uh, deriving a new assay to, uh, to understand and quantify the different splice variants. And uh, uh, the uh, T allele uh, 
um, had a uh, quite larger proportion of isoform 2 relative to isoform 1 when we quantified it, basically uh, indicating that this genetic variant that's associated with ARDS risk leads to a different angiopoietin 2 isoform. So as Michael said, uh, angiopoietin 2 is very important in endothelial barrier integrity. Um, uh, uh, prior studies in plasma, BAL, have shown that it associates with ALI and mortality, including, including a lot of the work done by Michael. Um, and then animal studies with ANG2 antagonists and ANG1 agonists have decreased some of this permeability and mortality. And then this, this intronic uh, variant uh, associates with ARDS. And so the question is, is this a different flavor of a vascular endotype uh, of ARDS that's defined by, uh, by genetics? And one of the ways that we're looking at it is that angiopoietin 2, VEGF, and some of these others have demonstrated these associations with ARDS. And as Michael said, some of these plasma biomarkers were also informative, and the animal models support uh, barrier enhancement independent of inflammation as important in ARDS. And so uh, the question that we're uh, focusing on now is, can we use this information to select which patients should re receive the anti ang 2 therapy uh, and other novel barrier enhancing agents? And these are underdeveloped. They have uh, under development. People uh, uh, have pegylated TIE2 and have other things that are aimed specifically at this axis. Okay, so in our, uh, in our Caucasian or European descent population, uh, because there were many other external populations that have um, uh, broad collections of, uh, of people who fit that profile uh, in the United States and internationally, we were able to extend our findings in Pentrama out to uh, University of Washington and then working with David Christiani and others uh, uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, uh, this same cutoff that we used uh, led to 12 SNPs and then two carried forward. Uh, uh, in one gene that were linked, and these two were in the IL-1 receptor antagonist gene. Uh, this is a, uh, a variant that uh, is actually quite um, uh, well studied in, in uh, large populations as actually being the major indicator, the major determinant of IL-1 level in, uh, in ambulatory patients with hypertension and collagen vascular diseases, worked on at University of Washington and Burroughs Welcome have shown that. Um, so in our, in our trauma patients, uh, it was protective and in our sepsis patients at MGH, likewise, it, uh, it, uh, it showed protection. And, and this is work that Nula presented a couple of years ago. Uh, more recently, in unpublished work, uh, uh, we've shown in the ARDSnet population um, versus a large panel of population controls working with, uh, with Mark Werfel at University of Washington that this odds ratio is actually identical uh, and has a, uh, a, a quite significant p-value. And if you look at the global meta-analysis p-value for over 5,000 subjects in four populations, this one variant is, is protective uh, for development, development of ARDS. So uh, IL-1-RN actually encodes the IL-1 receptor antagonist protein. And when you have an insult like sepsis or trauma and you get IL-1-beta that goes up, uh, your IL-1 receptor antagonist actually competes with that for the IL-1 receptor. Um, and, and as I said, IL-1 receptor antagonist production has been associated. In many ways, people think of this as an inflammatory rheostat, uh, again, in response to the evolutionary pressures that I spoke about before. Um, it's a pharmacologic tar target, and this is not new news. This has been studied for quite some time, uh, and, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So the question was, in our critically ill, uh, was the plasma uh, IL-1-RA uh, uh, affected by, your, by this genotype? And, and lo and behold, it was. Um, those with the CC genotype, those who had a lower risk of ARDS, um, actually had much higher levels of IL-1 receptor antagonists than either uh, CT or TT, um, uh, quite different, and the uh, P was significant for both uh, models. So this C allele was lower ARDS risk, higher plasma IL-1 receptor antagonist levels, consistent with prior large cell studies, as I said. So that's you know, human biomarker study in a critically ill patient, it's difficult to say, is this, you know, an epiphenomenon or is this actually what's going on? So we teamed up with uh, a, a buddy of mine, the guy who did the ABO stuff, Murdoch Riley, who also did, uh, when studying atherogenesis, something that I think is a little bit crazy, but got through IRBs, is that he did human uh, endotoxin challenge injection on 350 individuals. And so um, he had genome-wide, uh, he had uh, a DNA in all those patients and has been planning to do genome-wide genotyping. So we genotyped this population for our, uh, uh, for our IL-1 variant, 
and then also measured plasma IL-1 uh, receptor antagonists. And this is uh, every hour the blood was drawn uh, over time. And you actually have a different kinetic in those with this, uh, with this uh, C versus this with the T uh, uh, um, uh, variant. So the protective uh, allele actually leads to high, higher IL-1RA levels and, uh, uh, and, and actually a more rapid uh, upslope. Um, we then wanted to ask if this uh, affects mortality um, because the same things about inflammation and regulation of inflammation could be true in, uh, in, in mortality. So we teamed up with, uh, uh, with Keith Wally and the, and the VAST study, and, and lo and behold, this protective variant had lower mortality in the VAST study um, with a significant p-value. And Nula just published this in the Blue Journal uh, about six weeks ago. So <clears throat> can this be a therapy? Well, many of the people in the audience know that this was studied already. Uh, 1994, 1997. So the first one came out 20 years ago, right? Where people have studied uh, recombinant human IL-1 receptor antagonist, Anakinra, Kinneret, these, uh, these brands. Um, uh, signal for benefit uh, was there in the sickest patients. It never was statistically significant. And so we asked the question, or we are trying to ask the question, might variation uh, in the IL-1 receptor antagonist gene uh, influence response to exogenous IL-1-RA? So we've been working with Stephen Opel at Brown um, uh, to get some of these samples. And uh, as I said, there was a consistent direction of effect for reduced mortality. Um, but if you took these people out, the ones who have a genetically higher IL-1-RA level, would it, would, would it affect it? And we've done some modeling that shows that it might. And so the other thing we've done working with Steve Opel is we've actually gotten the serum, the 20-year-old serum, and we're uh, doing all sorts of crazy tricks in the lab to try to get DNA out of this. Um, these, this is what it looked like when we started, and, and when you're looking at principal components analysis, this means we got nothing. And, and then we did whole genome amplification using a couple of actually bacterial kits and ended up uh, um, really getting three separate genotype clusters in, in our, uh, our IL-1-RA. So we can do this, and we're starting to do it. So stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll have some of that next. One last thing that I want to throw in as a plug, because this was published two weeks ago. This is not ARDS in and of itself, but this concept of convergent biology with chronic syndromes and response to critical illness. This is a paper that Keith Wally published uh, yeah, 14, 15, 16 days ago in Science Translational Medicine, looking at variation in PCSK9. Uh, and uh, this is a, essentially a, a lipid and cholesterol regulatory gene that was discovered in these familial hypercholesterolemia families, uh, and that these loss of function variants actually have better survival uh, um, uh, uh, than the gain of function variants, including a, a significant uh, um, uh, significant uh, 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 protection uh, in, the, in the odds ratio. And I mean, this is uh, uh, really, really hot in the cholesterol world right now. This is New York Times about a year ago, uh, uh, this whole story of how these hypercholesterolemia families have led to an entire uh, generation of drugs. And so these are going to be cholesterol drugs that are going to be coming on the market in the next three, four years probably. And can we think about using these in our, in our uh, septic or ARDS patients guided by genotype? Um, so. In summary, uh, uh, I believe this. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm fairly skeptical about genetics in general, and I'm sort of a reluctant uh, genetic researcher, but I believe that, uh, that some of these human genetic studies in ARDS will likely lead to a better understanding of mechanism. Um, I also believe that uh, some of the uh, variants that have been studied have functionally relevant candidate loci, and I do believe that these genetic endotypes uh, may lead to shifting therapy paradigms. Uh, this is a large group of people who have contributed to this work, in particular, as I said, Nula Meyer, John, uh, John Riley, and, and Hauken Hauken Arson, who is my colleague that does a lot of the genotyping. Uh, these are the funding sources that contributed to the work, and I'm very thankful to the NIH for the multiple R01s that funded this research. So um, thank you. <laughs>